was supposed to walk around here. Is anybody here that wasn't walking properly by Gene Jones? I'll do it all over again. <laughs> what we had in mind here was just continuing as far as the workshop is concerned. We're just starting another phase of it in which, of course, you all I know are as vitally interested in the U.S. Congress item as I am, naturally, and, uh, and the fact that we got campaign financing as a consensus question on national board. I'll explain a little bit, perhaps, for Clark. I don't know how familiar he is with league procedure, but when we have study items, then we have consensus questions that are put out by national board, and this is what we are working on this fall. Yeah. Uh, and we will be through all of our units uh, discussing campaign financing, answering certain questions. The consensus will come from the local board uh, in, well, all, I was going to say in Iowa, but that's not true all over the country, uh, back to the national office in Washington, D.C., and then we will have a league consensus on campaign financing, which part of the hope of it, of course, is it will not be too narrow to restrict us and not so broad that it doesn't mean anything. There's a happy medium in there someplace that we continually strive for. And then under a new league thought or idea that was discussed and, and circulated to you since we had national council was that the consensuses, I never know whether it's a consensi or consensuses. Anyway, these multiple consensuses that we well, I come up with uh, can be applied horizontally and vertically so that what we come up with a national consensus on campaign financing can also apply to a state consensus on campaign financing. Several states already have a consensus. We had a study booklet, but we did not go th through the consensus questions. So this is our, one of our interests now, besides personal interest in this type of thing. And I would rather not say any more and would like to know what direction you want the workshop to take. And if you want to ask Mr. Bolenhoff questions, he has very nicely consented to meet with us. We have signed up his time, you know, for free, of course, until 12.30, and very graciously has said he will meet with us and, and do whatever we want to do. There you go. <laughs> you feel it. Yeah. talk some more than here. The top, it's right here. No, like the top part of this, we have been studying the U.S. Congress item, and we did get a consensus. Can you hear me? No. That thing doesn't go down. I have to sit tall. Uh, how do you do that? <laughs> we did get a consensus then on certain things. Now can you hear? On U.S. Congress. By the way, uh, did you, you can't hear a question. We should repeat the questions, uh, which I know and forget. She wanted to know if he could go down the consensus questions. So we'll repeat the questions as we hear. The top part of this, then, uh, are consensus ideas that came out of our previous study under the U.S. Congress, and do we agree with them and ensure the public's right to know and, and that. Now, down where it starts down in here on limitations are new consensus questions that the leagues will be answering in October that will go into national in November. So what she's referring, just this is what you're referring to then, would be down there where it says one, should there be limitations on? And then in my great wisdom, I figured out that yes, Y means yes, and N means no, and U means undecided. <laughs> and thank, and I, thank goodness they were not smart enough to put that other thing in here on the first ones we got out, it said NR. I thought they, somebody showed a little bit of intelligence here that they didn't put that in here. Well, and uh, so then it would be like contributions. Well, let me, let me just go over this, okay. and, and I, I assume most of you people have this. Uh, yes, it came. This the is question our, of whether there should be limitations on contributions, I, I think there certainly should be. And uh, uh, the level is always subject to uh, different opinions, and uh, I would think that... Uh, The three thousand dollar figures they're they're kicking around, or or even less, uh, for a top, would be uh, satisfactory. I don't know whether it'd be a thousand dollars more. Th these are the things that uh, 
you can get in long debates as to where the level is. Uh, the expenditures, I certainly do think there should be a, a limitation on expenditures, and if you put a, but this is an effective limitation. Uh, and there are so many problems that come up in connection with this. Uh, there has been in the past uh, a total barrier to uh, using union funds or corporation or funds for political contributions. Now, in fact, we've seen that there have been ways to get around this. Now, some of it was illegal, but there were other ways where, uh, for example, uh, labor unions have been able to take their personnel out and, and use their personnel to engage in what is supposedly nonpartisan work, but which in fact uh, helps one party or the other. The same thing is true of, of corporations. We've seen, and uh, the in the Bobby Baker case, we saw what the uh, finance companies of, of California were able to do uh, with ca cash contributions, and they were uh, making this up. They had about $100,000 in campaign uh, contributions in cash that went to Bobby Baker. And uh, this, the people who put this in were able to, were encouraged to put in false financial accounts to take expenses to the tune of $2,500 or $10,000, it was completely illegal, uh, to get the cash. And uh, uh, this, of course, is, is an illegality, and, and it comes to light only as to uh, the way it's policed. And uh, since most political administrations are a little antsy about ministering these things in a tight manner because you will usually catch some people on both sides. Uh, I mean, honesty isn't on one side or the other, and, and dishonesty. Uh, and so you would have a lax administration. The Congress uh, has had little inclination to want to tighten the laws uh, relative to Congress because the senior members of Congress on both sides uh, want a check and a control over the guy who's administering it. It's why uh, the Secretary of the Senate and the, and the uh, uh, Clerk of the House have been given these functions because all the senior members of the House felt that if worse came to worse and, and one of their minions got caught, that they could come in and put in a good word for him and dynamite the, the case. Uh, with the administrator. And this is why it's so important that the GAO have the subpoena power, uh, the subpoena power, and not, not that they personally can go out and subpoena the records on their own authority, but that they can make the request and then go into court in an open court proceeding to justify the subpoena. This avoids the situation where you would have a controller general or a director of the Office of Elections who would arbitrarily uh, be less than honest in, in administering the act where you would want to load things all on one side or the other. And uh, you can achieve it only with the right of subpoena of records documents and witnesses to require testimony under oath. And had they had this last year, see the only reason we really got Watergate pinned down is because of this r tough reporting disclosure act that went in on April 1st. But that did not, the weakness of that was that the Controller General and the Director of the Office of Elections did not have subpoena power so that the White House people and the Nixon re-election committee people and a hell of a lot of Democrats who were also involved in some various degrees of the same kind of hanky-pink could rest assured that Elmer Stotts and Phil Hugh, Sam Hughes could not come in and get records from them unless 
See, all, all he could do was report this to the Attorney General and wait for the Attorney General to take action. And this meant that it went from Hughes, he could make the decision, and then it had to go to the Attorney General, who was Kleindienst, for a decision. And the decision-making process then got to be such an interminable thing that uh, you had a good chance that many of these questions would not be resolved by the Attorney General until after the election. And the whole purpose of the act was defeated. Uh, if you actually have the, the proper policing power, many of the problems, uh, what's on the books right now, might work if the GAO had the authority and if you had an election commission that was independent uh, that would have control over congressional elections and Senate elections so that it got it out from under the political hierarchy. And say so these are things that are, are not partisan because they're, you find that the Republican leadership in the House and the Democratic leadership are real cozy on things like this, uh, where their own personal interests are involved. Well, you see it on, on salary things, where uh, the Republicans and the Democrat leadership get together on, uh, on deals for themselves, and about the only guy standing in the way of them usually is H.R. Crows. Uh, who, who, who forces uh, the issue uh, to a vote because many of these wage boosts for the Congress and for the congressional uh, staff members would go through just like that with nobody voting on them. You couldn't find out whether your congressman voted for it or against it. And it's gross that, that is, the, is the fellow who makes them go on record. If you want a salary, you at least vote for it and be accountable to your taxpayers out in your district. <laughs> yes? Well, it's a body of the Congress, but, but uh, it's insulated. It's so insulated. It's, it's a, an appointee by the president. But it's a 12-year term. I think it's a 12-year term. It's a 12 or 15-year term. But it's such a term that the fellow, and it can't be reappointed. And you can only be removed for cause. And most people, when they're put in that kind of a spot, even if they've had a good many problems in the past, uh, rise to the occasion and are independent and do the honest things that they, that they always wanted to do. See, I'm, uh, as I talk about corruption in politics, uh, you might get the impression that I have very low regard for uh, overwhelming number of public officials. The fact of the matter is that I think that most people in the House and the Senate, most people that aspire to public office want to do what's right. And that uh, only a small number of them are in it for the financial gains and the other kind of deals that come about. However, the pressures are, are there to throw the best people into uh, the hands of the lobbyists. Uh, there are too few groups <coughs> like the Iowa League of Women Voters, the League of Women Voters, any place, uh, or Common Cause. And, and I, I don't say this in endorsing Common Cause uh, as an institution, I mean, or what they stand for on every case. But they have been a very strong force, an independent force, outside of both political parties that represented, in the Watergate matter, it represented another lawsuit, another group that could not be controlled by the Democratic hierarchy or the Republican hierarchy. You remember there were some times here where it looked like Larry O'Brien might be making a deal for a settlement on his suit. Uh, the Democratic Party uh, might be maneuvering for a deal. Uh, the, one of the major things that kept them from making a deal was the fact that Common Cause was sitting there and had a suit pending that raised essentially the same issues and that even if they washed out the Democrats, uh, it was not going to be helpful. Yes.
Well, this, it's been talked about, and there have been all types of formulas. Did you hear, did you hear a question? <laughs> it's about, it's okay. a matter of, of I, I, did everyone hear it? Uh, there have been all types of formulas relative to getting television, because television is the most influential media there is. Uh, I should, probably shouldn't say that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it has a tr tremendous impact. And everyone is in agreement that some means of getting a fair distribution of this uh, must be arrived at. Uh, there are all types of formulas. I, I would think that uh, you could, on a limited time basis, uh, provide free time, that there would be a requirement. <clears throat> so you didn't have any money changing hands. That's, that's that money changing hands that, that uh, uh, gets most of these people into trouble. Uh, you had a minimum of money changing hands. You just have free blocks of time that the networks or this, the television stations had to give to public service and that in election periods that it had to go for the airing of the views of the candidates. Now, uh, as in the last primaries, uh, the proliferation of, of Democratic candidates uh, presented a problem. And uh, we saw what that problem was because uh, when you had two or three, uh, three or four minor candidates, <laughs> that fellow with a rat up in New Hampshire. Uh, I mean, such a waste of time. Uh, but there's any kind of a system you're going to devise is going to have that waste of time because there is no way that you can control what the candidates say or how they perform without to a degree interfering with their right to free speech. Now, while I thought that the man wielding the rat with the tail was a uh, waste of time and a lot of damn foolishness, it served its purpose. When he waved the rat, he ruled himself out as a serious candidate. And, and uh, if that's the way you eliminate people, why, that's... Yeah, and, and I think that, that in uh, across Iowa here, I would think that from a practical standpoint, most of the stations would be perfectly happy to have uh, congressional candidates, senatorial candidates on with a certain length of uh, amount of time, uh, probably, you know, the senatorial campaign uh, candidates about once a week or three weeks prior to the election, an hour or so, that they could discuss whatever the issues were. The yeah. Well, I think that I think that there's I think that there's a very good way to uh, uh, arrange this, and I think that would be uh, to s set aside the time. And if the incumbent didn't want the time, that uh, the other side would get the time just by. <laughs> and I think that'd cause a lot of candidates to come out and take part in the shows, because they have an obligation come out, and that's part of what the uh, imbalance is. The incumbent has too damn many advantages now in the mailing lists and the things that go out from the offices with a frank on them. And, and uh, if there was some kind of provision in the law that said it's going to be so much time, if you don't want to show up, that's too bad. You're opponent can get on there and, and use up that time if he wants to. We've made it available to you. They'd come flocking you. Yes? Uh, what? Is it customary in Chicago for the campaign uh, headquarters or the candidates to retain campaign funds? Is this traditional that it does not go to the party? And is there any way that this can be controlled by law? Well, it, it obviously <coughs> has been practiced, as we've seen in the Nixon, in both parties. And uh, uh, the business of 
of getting out one of the, one of the most important things in this administration of, of campaign funds is that there must be some way to keep the cash flow down to a minimum. And there are many suggestions in this area that I think are highly practical. Uh, one that's on the way now is the limitation of cash contributions to less than $100. Uh, I think, and I know the GAO people think, that uh, you could reduce that to $10 and that it wouldn't hurt anything, it wouldn't be too much of a burden, and that even then, if they wanted to contribute more in cash, that it be a requirement that it be returned unless it was accompanied by a signed statement by the person as to why it was necessary to make it in cash. And, and you see, th these are important devices because they're, they're thought through, and, and Sam Hughes and, and Stotts have been giving a lot of thought to these matters. And they're, they're all ways to stop sneaky money, and that's really, the, that's really the whole point, to stop the big contributors from buying candidates and to stop sneaky money. And that doesn't make any difference what kind of sneaky money it is. In some races, that sneaky money can be $100. Uh, broken up into many little pieces uh, and if I'm thinking in terms of a, a congressional race in Iowa for example where uh, the, the amount of money spent in the congressional races is, is very small a uh, few thousand dollars I think that the maximum contribution that gross received was something like $500, and uh, uh, aside from the basic 5000 that gets back from the congressional, the overall congressional campaign, and I think this is comparable to, to most of the congressmen in Iowa because, uh, well, most of them here are, are really quite honest. I, I, I have to say that uh, in the Iowa delegation, uh, There are no dishonest candidates that I know of as this point in time. <laughs> uh, and, and that the overall indications are that, that they are, for the most part, uh, honest people. And that's because you keep them honest and we keep them honest. Uh, they know that if they're involved in a conflict of interest, a nepotism, or anything like that, that the Des Moines Register is going to have it on page one. And that inevitably, although there will be all types of things that the newspapers of this state will fuss about and take different positions on, that on the question of integrity in government, you can almost count on 100% uh, adherence to the highest standard.
they would, the, the, the controller general, or the, depending upon the law, would issue the subpoena for the records. But if there was any, if there was any objection to this, then a contest, see this is done every day by various congressional committees. They have a subpoena, the chairman of the committee issues the subpoena, and then they go to court if there's a contest. And then a federal judge in an open session determines whether it's a fair subpoena so that Elmer Stotts and Hughes have a check on them, even though they're independent, that they should have a check upon them to make sure that they're not abusing the power because the power of subpoena is a, is a, is a great power and could be abused and uh, is abused. Well, now they now they would have to now they would have to go send it to the Justice Department and rely not upon their judgment, but upon the judgment of the Attorney General to make a decision on his own that he go to the courts to have either a civil action or a grand jury action, and th this was this has been highly uh, ineffective. And it has uh, the built-in uh, defects of political partisanship that your Justice Department operates under. Well, they're really bypassing that. This is bypassing, and there are a good many other areas. Uh, GAO at the present time on contracts can't get records from the executive branch. Uh, executive privilege is claimed against the GAO on financial records. It's a lot of damn foolishness. There's no reason in the world why they should hide these things from the GAO, particularly when the Budgeting and Accounting Act of 1921 sets out specifically that he should have all records of the executive branch. But since they have to go to the Attorney General, and that the Attorney General is the lawyer for the President, and inevitably finds himself aligned with his other cabinet officers in opposition to this, they do not have an effective means. Uh, the use of the courts directly should be open to the congressional committees, too. The congressional committees, as it stands now, for the most part, on contempt, have to go to the Justice Department, which may be effective 80 percent of the time where there's no political aspect involved. But 20 percent of the time where there's a political acts involved, why they, they can't get action. Yes. I think that uh, they, they might be shortened somewhat, they might be lengthened somewhat. Uh, you, this is something you can argue about interminably as to whether a couple of months campaign or three months campaign is is too much or too little. I, I think that the the policing of these funds is really the, the key issue and if you police it well enough you limit the spending and the activity and the each person then has so much money here, and he, it's up to him to decide the best way to spend that money in whether it's a two-month period or three-month period. And if he's a damn fool and wastes it, then he's a damn fool that you don't want in office. That's really the, uh, what it boils down to. Yes. Well, uh, if, if you could tell me when Congress is going to get out, I'd like to know because I have never been able to predict, uh, and even in the last week that they're around and everybody knows they're going to wind up, you can miss it by, you know, three or four days that people are hat following the gallery all the time. They usually get the appropriations bills passed, particularly the appropriations for congressional talent. Uh, uh, <laughs> and staff. <laughs> but uh, 
I see nothing wrong with a Congress being in session essentially the year round uh, and taking time off because when it gets down to it, in the end, they're usually in too damn much of a hurry uh, to get out of there anyway, and, and that's where your, your silly damn legislation gets through. It's, uh, it's when you get the tax amendment put on a bill in the wee hours of the evening uh, to help a Bahamian bank, and nobody knows why. Uh, <laughs> yes? I think that would be, since he, uh, he can speak uh, uh, freely on that subject these days, uh, having made the decision, he's not going to go beyond that. Uh, I think that there is a good deal to be said for making sure that John Williams uh, suggested a limitation on age, that no one uh, run for office after he was I was 65 or there was 67 was spoken of as a, and John Williams, uh, putting his money where his mouth was, bowed out uh, voluntarily, which was a blow. I mean, he was one who was vigorous as a man 50 when he was 65, and he should have stayed, and he was a hell of a great force. But uh, uh, you also, though, you, you have, when you get into that field, you do have some of the people who are there that are remain great independent figures for long after the time that uh, they would normally uh, be uh, active, and you would eliminate those with uh, with that kind of an action. Although I've been watching this Foreign Affairs Committee, Foreign Relations Committee of the Senate this last couple of weeks on Kissinger, is there were a dead-headed, uh, compliant committee, the way they played dead for Kissinger, I mean, no questions asked at all, essentially, about the wheat deals. And he was the essential architect of the wheat deals because he was in charge of the White House, the pressure for some kind of economic transactions. His man was Helmut Sonnenfeld, who carried out the details of it. Helmut Sonnenfeld uh, dealt with Butts in the Agriculture Department, Palmby and others, and the fact of the matter is they've had to admit that this was a mess, that they didn't have any idea what a $250 million a year wheat sale to the Soviet Union would do to domestic markets. They didn't have any idea that the Soviet Union would not only take $250 million, but that they would go ahead and buy more than a billion, and that this would absolutely destroy, turn our, turn our m markets upside down, problem in the soybean markets and what they've done to the planning of the farmers in this country. Hell, if the Stalin had been sitting over there or Lenin trying to destroy us with some grand plan that they devised 20 or 30 years ago, they couldn't have done it any better. Because what it's done to the food prices, the whole economy, and he wasn't held accountable one bit, wasn't even asked any questions about what his explanation was for it. Well, Fulbright was a Rhodes Scholar. And when he got through with being a Rhodes Scholar, he knew everything in the world, and he never had to work or think or do anything except complain about a, an arrogance of power in the executive branch of the government. So year after year, he whines, he complains, he writes books about the arrogance of power, and his own negligence is the most 
devastating example of incompetence on the part of a chairman. Here's a bright guy who should have some drive. And if, if he had the kind of drive behind his intelligence that Senator Hughes has, Senator Congressman Gross has, that uh, Congressman Smith has, he could do something because he would try to actually be a check. If there's any damn foolishness, if we've got lousy ambassadorial appointments, it's Bill Fulbright's problem just as damn much as it is the fault of any administration that's down there because he has the power to do something about it and to be effective and he hasn't done one damn blasted thing in the last 20 years that I've been around Washington. I've never found any, and aside from occasionally there are requirements, usually there are requirements that legal officers be lawyers, and I'm not sure that's good. Uh, but uh, aside from that, or that science in science fields, but, but aside from that, uh, you could go to some mental institution and make the appointments as far as the qualifications are concerned. Well, the fact of the matter is that, that the lack of qualifications is, is one of the uh, things that you couldn't get through. Uh, you, you, you couldn't get qualifications legislation through Congress because after having served in Congress a few years, all of them, regardless of how they served in Congress or their background, educational or otherwise, they all feel totally competent to, to fill almost any position. And therefore, uh, every congressman would feel that he was voting against himself if he started putting standards in there. Well, but they are always thinking in terms of they do lose. And on, on that particular point, I, <laughs> having a, a conversation with Senator Hughes recently relative to the appointment of uh, uh, Senator Miller to the Court of Customs and Claims, uh, and uh, he was speaking, and he, he was commenting and, and, and quipping, said uh, he was going out, of, I had commented that Jack Miller had failed in politics and he was being appointed to the bench and, and that uh, Hughes, at least up to this point, was successful and he was getting out and taking up the work of the Lord at some time in the future. And he said, uh, well, we've seen that Mr. Nixon takes care of his. We've yet to see whether the Lord's going to take care of his. <laughs> Interesting comment. <laughs> yes. Uh, the fact of the matter is that this is something that every administration says it's doing, yet every administration keeps the throttle hold on it. Uh, there are suggestions every once in a while of ways that you might do this, but none of them have been, have been workable because, number one, how do you say that you can't appoint a political figure for anyone who's been active in politics as attorney general because that's how you get people interested in politics. 
uh, you hold out the possibility that they might get an appointment. And if they were active and they were to be barred automatically from being appointed to the cabinet post for lawyers, if all lawyers didn't think that they might be attorney general or judge or assistant attorney general sometimes, you wouldn't have very damn many people, uh, lawyers active in politics. Uh, they're always thinking about this, and uh, there's no way that you could devise to, all, all you can do is, is keep the pressure on to avoid a situation where that becomes the major focal point, and complain like hell to the members of the Judiciary Committee whenever someone like John Mitchell or um, Bobby Kennedy and I'd throw them in the same, or Ramsey Clark uh, comes up for nomination because it's obvious that they were not selected because of their great knowledge of constitutional law or their great depth of trial experience. I remember Jack Kennedy uh, quipped that uh, he wanted to give Bobby a little experience over there. It was as good a place for him to get experience as anything. Uh, and I guess for his purposes, that was the that was the best way of handling it in a light manner, uh, because there was no way you could handle it. And, and I must say, Bob Kennedy was a good friend of mine, and I thought, by and large, was a good attorney general, and, and did great things as far as uh, the fights on organized crime and prosecution of of democratic political figures. The fact of the matter is, it was one stage, of course he had a Republican as head of the criminal division, which helped uh, keep him on a straight and narrow. Uh, Herbert Jack Miller, who, who he had met through the Teamsters investigations, was a past Republican who was appointed as head of the criminal division. And, and I think Bob, to a degree, did this knowing that this would be a balance wheel for him politics, but there was a stage, Kenny O'Donnell, who was uh, President Kennedy's appointment secretary, was, was really a, a very ruthless politician. Uh, he was as nasty as Ehrlichman or Haldeman either one. Uh, he just didn't have it his way. Uh, you know, he was punish your enemies and reward your friends and don't prosecute Democrats, but prosecute hell out of those Republicans. Uh, but the, the check on him was both Bob Kennedy's good judgment and Jack Kennedy's good judgment and the fact that they had uh, Herbert Jack Miller there. And in the first weeks, the first months they were in office, the Kennedys prosecuted a Democrat up in northern Indiana on tax fraud who had been one of their first supporters. He, he was uh, at Lake County, most corrupt county, I think, in the whole of Indiana, and that's saying something in Indiana. <laughs> uh, and he was on this, this the, and the uh, tax frauds involved payoffs in connection with local deals in the courts. So you know, it was a real messy situation. And uh, there were two or three of these things that came along in quick succession. and. Uh, Jack Miller got to the point where he was saying he wished he could find a, a Republican to prosecute so Kenny O'Donnell wouldn't be saying that he was in the conspiracy with some others on the outside to prosecute only Kennedy Democrats. But, but the, the fact that it went ahead demonstrated that in the criminal prosecution area, at least in that period of time, that politics was at a minimum. And I might say, under Nixon, I do not think in the criminal division that there has been much politics in the prosecution because uh, Kleindienst, although Mitchell would be highly politically motivated, Kleindienst a little less politically motivated, but wanting to do basically a good job, being so cocky and, and uh, just arrogant that he wanted to be sure he wasn't going to be caught off base on anything. And then his relationship with Henry Peterson, 
who is a career employee and who, if they had political inclinations, wouldn't slap them in the face but say, well, Dick, are you sure you want to do this? And uh, that that would be enough in most cases to steer them away. And I see no indication at all that with all of the other problems, and most of them stemming from this little White House game, that the, uh, the prosecution of people in, on criminal charges was particularly political. Had they, had they had subpoena power, they could have walked into the Nixon re-election committee headquarters on June 18th or 19th and said, let's have the records. And that would have been quick enough to have avoided the paper shredders. And the people who put them through the paper shredders would not have put them through the paper shredders because their legal counsel would have told them GAO's got, got subpoena power, and they'll be in here next week asking for those. And, and you can tell at this stage, the testimony of, of Sloan, uh, Rob Odell, and Jeb Magruder, uh, that their major concern through this whole period of time was the GAO. And then that Democratic suit, the civil suit, that Larry O'Brien slapped on them a week after the election, and with the power of deposition. So you had a power of deposition growing out of the civil action. And that this was also a, a strong, the strongest pressure for them to be, to at least keep reasonable records so they wouldn't be caught clear on this. Yeah. Yes. There is no way that you can equalize this completely. The incumbent is always going to have some advantage. The questions raised relative to the television situation uh, is one way you could equalize this. If the incumbent didn't want to go on television, that you'd give the free television to the other side. Uh, you might also uh, provide a franking privilege during a specific period of time. Uh, but I, I'm not sure that that would be good. I think you keep the frank off of, uh, because the incumbent there could be blatantly political at a specific period of time, and he has the office staff that he could get this done on overtime well, the, the incumbent has so many advantages, and, and you're, you're right in that, but someone from the outside, there's no way you can equalize this completely. All, I'm just going to be satisfied, really, if some way that you do not strive for perfection, but that you just strive for something a little better than we have now, and, and I think that giving GAO uh, subpoena power would be one of those. The limitations on expenses would be others. The elimination of cash contributions is another. These are things that are clear, black and white. There is no solid argument that can be given for big cash contributions. Everybody deplores it when they get caught. Even Mr. Nixon. Yes. Well, the uh, operation.
operation of Ehrlichman Haldeman in the White House absolutely destroyed the independence of the cabinet officers and made it impossible for them to function. Many of the people who, who could have been good cabinet officers, and I make reference to George Romney as one of those because he had been, I would say this is with very limited education, I think he had high school and, and just some <coughs> scattering of the first year or two of, of college uh, work uh, before he went off on that Mormon mission and then he got back and got into business in the PR work in, in Washington politics. Uh, he had been successful in essentially everything he'd done. I mean, American Motors, just as, a, just as an honest guy. And the fact of the matter is, he's an honest, hardworking guy who knew what the hell he was doing in American Motors. He outwitted this fellow Wolfson simply because Wolfson didn't know how to handle an honest man. I mean, he'd been looking for angles. And you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, uh, thing. Y you know, that's, that's one of the easiest ways to deceive the crooks. Just be straight across the board. Uh, they're always saying, well, what's his angle? And if you haven't got any angle, they're spending so damn much time looking for your angle <laughs> and being sure you're so clever in covering up your angle that you just keep them confused. And, and that would have been a, a great deal of, of uh, George Romney's strength. And then when he was running the state of Michigan, it was the same basic approach. He was in straightening out an absolute fiscal mess in that state. Uh, he was just straight across the board, active, energetic, and what he went into, dedicated, and uh, all things came out right. law passed by Congress, and the fact of the matter is such legislation is now in the works, and in the, the things that where I think there's, there's no question about being steps forward is the, the subpoena power for GAO, the elimination of cash contributions completely, or the demanding of an explanation for each cash contribution unless it's returned. And boy, when they want to, they're going to, uh, they're going to want those explanations or the, because most political figures don't want to return that, that money. And an independent commission that would handle all of these things. Now, I'm satisfied with the GAO, but I'm also uh, recognized that Congress might shy away from giving the GAO, in fact, has shied away from giving the GAO, authority over Senate and House races because they're afraid they'd be too goddamned independent. Uh, and I'm sure they would. The commission, you would have the Comptroller General as an ex officio head of this, and then a director of an elections office comparable to Hughes as a chief executive officer, and but your commission itself would probably include two people picked by the Republican and the, and the Democratic leadership of the Senate, a couple of people picked by the Democratic and Republican leadership of the House, the requirements being that they not be employees of the Senate or the House or in any way subservient to the executive branch so that, that, that you would have true independent people, that you would set those standards, and when each appointment was made by the president, uh, that you would have those standards there and you could judge your, your presidents pretty well by who the hell they appointed. And even if they were going to be up to some sneaky business, on the policies, and see, they'd have only general policy guidance matters. Uh, your actual administration day by day 
would be by the GAO, which is already insulated and does one hell of a great job in these areas. So they would have to, even if one of them turned out to be a, a corrupt so-and-so, he would have the problem of getting around all the other honest people and getting a direction through the Controller General and the Director of the Office before he could do any funny business. Well, th that legislation, uh, I think, that legislation is in the Senate and the House. Uh, some parts of this is uh, in legislation that's already passed the Senate. But uh, precisely what parts of it, I can't remember just now because there's so much legislation and they're going back at it with new tries and, and the other house has not acted at this stage. But th th just three or four of these things, if you could get those through without any kind of fuss, the question of federal financing could be taken up and probably should be taken up as a separate package. Yes. 